let me welcome everyone on our weekly seminar. And today, the speaker is Ovidius Makuta, who is uh, actually my PhD student. And he will tell us about uh, the impossibility of generation of graph states in certain quantum networks. Okay, Ovidius, you can start. Thank you. I will begin by introducing the quantum networks in general. So in very general terms, quantum networks consist of a set of parties and a source of quantum states. And these quantum states are distributed to each party, uh, not necessarily to each, but uh, to some parties. So yeah, this is the setup. We have some Why set of- Why do they look like spiders? Uh, because of the uh, oh, because they web. Uh, no, because like uh, it's a kind of a joke uh, network web, and the uh, and the next level joke is that actually this kind of spider doesn't produce a web, so it's like a joke in in a joke, and I find it really funny. <laughs> uh, but also they are kind of easy to animate, uh, animate. So yeah, uh, yeah. So basically, we have a bunch of um, bunch of parties uh, that. Uh, are uh, hold some particles that are uh, produced by some sources. This is in really general terms. However, I will talk about more specific quantum networks. First of all, I will assume that uh, sources are bipartite. So they can produce any, really any state. However, it can only be bipartite. So I don't assume anything about local dimension, but I impose this tensor structure. So this is the first assumption, and it's kind of logical in terms of what we have uh, available right now uh, in terms of uh, lab experiments, because usually sources of entanglement are these nonlinear crystals that produce entangled photons, and they are produced in pairs. So this is kind of uh, kind of uh, maybe weak, but a reasoning behind it. Uh, and every party can perform some local operations on their set of particles. Um, this local operation really can be anything. So it, can, uh, it doesn't really have to even preserve the dimension. And in fact, in what I will be talking about, uh, it will not. Yeah, but in, in terms of, uh, it's, not, it's not like it's unitary, it's really any local operations. We also assume that uh, every party share, can share some randomness, this classical randomness. Uh, and, in, and you can think about it as maybe some uh, structured strategy that they decided on pre-experiment or just classical color correlation. And the final assumption is that we do not allow classical communication between the parties. This, uh, this has some merit in terms of quantum network latency. Uh, if we assume that, okay, they, com com they can communicate, so they can perform LOCC, then we first have to distribute the state, then some measurement has to be performed, and there, there's additional time, which, uh, which is just basically from the fact that they are not all in the same lab. So parties can, um, can have a distance between them like many, many kilometers. And then the latencies, uh, the delays start to adapt uh, and quantum, quantum network latency starts to increase. Right now, it's not such a big deal because uh, everything is basically either in the, the same lab or the distances are pretty small. However, looking into the future, I do believe that it is important to think about what states can we generate in a network that do not require us to communicate, uh, to, in, uh, to allow the communication of parties. So basically, state is distributed, parties do something on a state, and what's then? What, what can we achieve with just these tools? So with this description, we have uh, this, uh, we can describe the global state as, the state as such. So lambda here is again, uh, shared randomness. Uh, P, uh, this is just some coefficient that sum to one. Uh, E1 here 
is a local operation acting uh, action of a local operation by party one and we tensor product if, uh, till party n and sigma is just a tensor product of all bipartite sta states distributed by our sources in the network. Uh, there is a small, um, a, a, uh, th there is a small discussion to be had maybe uh, about this sigma and uh, because like in theory it can always uh, it can always depend also on this lambda. However, it so happens that this is not the problem since we don't assume the dimension of the uh, of sigmas. So, uh, so we can actually always take out these lambdas to local operations. That's just a small digression. Uh, yeah, there's a question, I think. Uh, you mean on the chat? So it's like- the... uh, No, 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 the, there is a raised hand. Ah, okay. Uh, Joseph, you can unmute yourself and ask the questions. Uh, yes. Uh, the... TE is a permutation matrices with a... Mm, sorry, sorry, TE? Uh, the e, I, the e, one e, until EN. Mm -hmm. These, these are, are local are operations. Are the permutation? Mm, permutation? Uh, can you because rephrase that? Just some general channel, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A really general channel. Like I said, like local, local operations. So uh, it's not a unitary or anything. It can be whatever. Just basically, it has to preserve some quantum properties. So we have to get a state as a result. Okay. Mm. Yeah, and there, there is also something important here because uh, there is a tensor product here, a tensor product here. However, uh, these are not between the same, maybe sp spaces. Uh, to explain what is really going on, let's see an, uh, at this example. Uh, let's look at this example. Uh, here we have two parties, one, two. Sigma one, two is this state shared over here. So in terms of tensor product, this is this thing here. However, if we switch to local operations uh, that each of this party performs, we have E1 acting on this and E2 acting on this. So this tensor product is different from this tensor product. Uh, this is uh, like, uh, this is not really that important uh, for a bigger picture, but it's something that can trip, uh, trip you up if you are not really paying attention to it. Okay, so let's talk about an example to help you better understand what is going on. Let's consider a tripartite network that is fully connected. Uh, to simplify our notation, we will introduce some this kind of pictures. So here are lines with dots at the end uh, represent the states that are distributed, and hexagons he hexagons uh, represent parties that are labeled here below them. And we will not uh, denote and uh, the dependence on the round, uh, uh, on this lambda because uh, it is really not, uh, this lambda is al always there. It's not really relevant to what will happen later. Basically, we want to make this picture as clear as possible. Mm, and thus, in this uh, scenario, the state is like this. This is basically what I've written before. So we have uh, a, uh, E1, E2, E3 acting on sigma, that is a tensor product of all of these states. And this is another example. So if we remove uh, two and three, this doesn't change because we still have the same parties. However, between them, one of the sigmas disappears. Okay, so now let me talk about the uh, inflation method. This is something that was first introduced for uh, some casual, ca casual inference. Uh, this is more of a 
classical maybe in a sense view um, of infrastructure however the, the, it was quickly generalized to quantum cases and then my work uh, our work is basically based on this paper which I, what they showed i will talk about later but basically these are the three important papers however there's also one more paper uh, because um, some of you may remember that on this very seminar in December last year, uh, there was a talk of L Lawrence, uh, and he also talked about uh, network inflations. Uh, I will uh, this this is basically at the same technique, but used in a different way. I want to talk about it briefly here, just because you may have some intuition from that talk that do not really apply here. So let me start. We start again from the tripartite state. What Lawrence was talking about in his inflations was a scenario like this. So we double, we basically make, make a copy of each state, and then we, uh, we allow parties to decide on which state they will measure. And then they used it to construct some hierarchy uh, similar to the NPA. But this is not the scenario I will be talking about. Instead, I will be talking about a scenario in which we copy each state and each party, like so maybe. This is the simplest uh, network inflation. Uh, and I will always assume that each, well, sorry, each party has access to the, the same number of particles as the original. So here, or each original had like two particles, and here it, each copy also has two particles. In terms of, uh, to describe it formally, here are the equations. So basically we assume that each party performs, uh, each copy of a party, so uh, one and one prime performs exactly the same local operations. And we assume that the state between one, two, one prime, two prime, or in some other cases, one, two prime, two, one prime, so here, they are exactly the same and they are the, uh, as in the original network. So it's basically a one-to-one -one copy. So in this network inflation, the global state, uh, state is as such. Uh, here we um, have to tensor more of a local operation because, because we also have three copies. So it goes for, for one to three, one prime to prime, three prime. And this state is actually just a tensor product of uh, sigmas on the original network, which is, I think, easy to see because uh, these two networks kind of do not interact with each other. So it's, it makes sense that this structure would be preserved. However, uh, oh, I'm sorry. And uh, yeah, this is uh, an important uh, thing. Because one may think, okay, so this is true. So also a row can be described as a tensor product of a row that was on the original network. However, this is not the case because of the shared randomness. We assume that each party has the same shared randomness. So this kind of messes up with this maybe. Uh, so this, this allows this like the composition. However, if we trace out, one prime, two prime, three prime, for example, then we have this correspondence. And the same would be if we traced out one, two, and three. This equality would still hold. OK, so now we have a different inflation. Uh, the, the assumptions are still the same. So, But the difference is that party one shares a state with party two prime. Again, by our, our assumption, this is the same state as was shared in one, two. And we, again, get really similar structure in a row. However, sigma is different because now these two net kind of subnetworks mix together. Then there is, uh, we cannot describe it as before here. So we, here we had a tensor product, just the composition. However, here it's not possible because the uh, sigmas are mixed. However, we still want to 
have some kind of relation between this, the state of this inflation and the state over original network. This will be important for our use of the uh, inflation method later, which I, I will get to, I promise. Um, basically, what can, we can do, we can trace out the rest here, two, one prime, two prime, three prime, which I describe, which I represented by the smoke here. And okay, looking just at this, from which network does it come from? We can't really tell. Uh, we can't really tell because, well, this structure is in all of them. Uh, sorry. Oh, yeah. So, which means basically that row one, two, so if we trace out three in original networks, three, one prime, two prime, three prime, and inflation, we get this equality. I want you to really uh, remember this picture because this is, even though these things, so these are called marginals and they are uh, equal to each other and we can do these calculations through them and everything that I will talk about can be done rigorously. However, it's not easy to think about because we had to, for each, we would have to really prove it again and again. And actually it turns out that thinking about this as a kind of a smoke, really is basically the same as with just doing it uh, strictly mathematically. Uh, so how are, what are the rules for this smoke or rather tracing out? Well, what about this? Now we also see uh, party two. However, since we see one, party one and party two, we can also see both of their particles. And through this tracing out, we can, there is actually a difference between one and two being connected and being disconnected. Which means that this picture here cannot come from either original network or this I0, which was basically two, two, two copies of the original network. Conversely, if we have this structure, we cannot have it from I1 because in I1, one is connected to two prime and two is connected to one prime. Okay, so now let's uh, see in an example, how do you actually use network inflation to prove something? We'll consider uh, this quantum network, fully connected quantum network, and we will consider uh, GHZ state. And we ask, okay, can we generate this state on this network? Uh, yes, there's a question. Uh, yes, before moving to the to to the proof, uh -huh. uh, is this uh, networks uh, used for quantum uh, quantum graph net network like we use in uh, graph uh, machine learning on a network? Or no, no, no. Uh, th this is uh, uh, this is a different. Yeah, uh, this is something different because like there are quantum networks, there are quantum tensor networks, and there are also neural networks. Uh, no, <laughs> all of them are different. Although there is some some similarities between tensor networks and these quantum networks, but, yeah, but but I don't want to really talk about it. So yeah, for the purposes of this talk, they are all different, and no, the, the, unfortunately, there is no connection. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so back to this example. Um, to really show it, we first assume that this state can be generated here, and we will show we will see what the consequences of it are, of this assumption are. So, okay, we start from this simple inequality. That is true for, this is disconnected from quantum networks. This is true for every uh, two matrices that fulfill these conditions. Uh, so we can also create, we can also use this, uh, this inequality for some operators that are actually calculated this expected value, th this, sub, this index here, means that we calculate this expected value over the state that is generated in I0. And these are Pauli matrices acting on the first party, second party, third party. This is X, X Pauli matrix. And this is, these are Z Pauli matrices. This is one and this is two prime, which is important here because of this prime 
they they both uh, they anti commute, so we can actually use this inequality. This is always true. But let's see. Let's try to really see what our assumption about GHZ being generated in our original networks tells us about the values of these expected values. Uh, OK, so we first analyze this expected value. We have this network. And let us trace out the rest. So we, again, have some smoke. Because in this expected value, there is uh, the matrix is acting on primed parties are trivial. They are just identities. So we can actually trace them out. And from the point of view of this expected value, this is basically a picture of, of this network that this expected values kind of sees. OK, but this is just an original, uh, this, our original network. And actually, so we have this equality. Because from the point of view of this expected value, there is no difference between this and this. So we can write this equality. However, if you know anything about GHZ state, you know that this is a stabilizing operator of GHZ state, meaning that GHZ acting on this gives you back GHZ, which so from this assumption means that this is equal to one, which in turn. So okay, so we have this equality because from the point of view of this expected value, there is no difference, and since we assume the row is GHZ, and the GHZ is stabilized by the, this operator. We know that this expected value equals 1. And so also expected value on I1 has to equal 1, which means that here we have 1. Now look, uh, let's look at this expected value. OK, so we, we are back again at I0. And when we turn our smoke on, so we trace out the unimportant parties. We see that there is this weird structure between party one and party two prime. They are absolutely non-connected. However, we can do something about it, namely that we assume that uh, local operations are the same for each copy of a party. And since we don't really have any information about in this scenario about uh, whether it's party to prime or two, we can ask, actually switch them around. So from the point of view of this expected value, this is the same just with removing this prime. However, looking at this, well, we've seen this structure before. This is the inflation I1, because here, I, uh, one and two are not connected, and so this structure is preserved. So what we get is that z, z1, z2 prime on i0 is equal z1, z2 on i1. And now we can actually ask ourselves, okay, so how can we calculate this one then? Uh, we would like to go straight to the original network. However, it's, it's not really possible because we have this discon disconnect between these two parties. Mm, we cannot really do that directly. However, we can do it via some stabilizing mm, argument. Let's say that we know that these two things are true. Because these are Pauli matrices, this also means that state row one, uh, state generated on I1 is stabilized by Z1, Z3, and Z2, Z3. So if these two things are true, this means this is stabilized. And we can multiply this and this, which gives us this. So we basically have this relation. OK, we, you might expect that we are going to prove that this is actually equal to 1. But we are not there yet. Uh, we have this relation that this is equal to 1 if this and this is equal to 1. We do this because these expected values are actually far easier to work with than this one. OK, so um, let's start from this expected value, z1, z3. If we trace out all of the unimportant parties, we again have this picture. 
Okay, but this is again something that we've seen. This structure is present in all of inflation, that, uh, all of the networks that we discussed. And so it is also present in the original network. So we have, uh, we, by the assumption that this is uh, the, uh, on this network GHZ is generated, we have this, we have shown this. And then going back to this expected value, we have exactly the same argument. We trace out the unimportant parties. And again, from the point of view of this expected value, there is no difference between uh, this big inflation I1 and the original party which means that this is also true, which fulfills these conditions, which in turn means that this is also true. And so by we've taken this inequality, we've constructed this inequality on a, a network inflation. And then by assuming that rho uh, is equal to GHZ, we basically showed that this is violated. However, this is true for everything, uh, for every scenario. This is not connected to quantum networks. This is just plain true. And so our assumptions have to be wrong, which means that GHZ cannot be generated in this network. However, there is actually more. Since, OK, we've considered this network. But what about this network? Well, we don't really have to actually consider this kind of network, because we've never made any assumptions about sigmas. And if we assume that sigma is equal to just basically a product state between one and two, uh, oh, sorry, this should be three and two, then we can remove this connection, basically. Because like this state doesn't really do anything if it's a product state. OK, the, each party gets it. But then again, we can also all, always assume that each party also holds uh, a state to begin with. Some uh, and if it's not entangled with anything else, then it's basically useless from our point of view. And so we can actually simulate each possible network by just considering a fully connected ones. And that's what we will do for the rest of this talk. OK, so now let me talk about graph states briefly. Uh, graph states are states that uh, have a correspondence bet uh, between a structure of a graph. So from this graph, we can construct these operators. And this is done in a way, OK, let's look at the first vertex. The first vertex is connected to 2 and 3. So G1, this is uh, G1 ha has, GI has also always XI. So this is basically the vertex that we are considering. And then we put Z in each party that is a neighbor with one. So if we look, for example, at two, two is a neighbor with one. However, it's not a neighbor with three. So we put a one here. And again, three, X three is a neighbor with one. However, it's not a neighbor with two. So we put one here. And we define a graph state as an eigenvector with eigenvalue one of all of these operators, which basically means that this state is stabilized by these operators. In general, this is a formula. This is really not that important, but uh, I just wanted to, for completeness, give you this. Uh, so basically, like I said, uh, gi equals xi, and then we have a product over all of j's that are in a neighborhood of i. And then we define state as such. This is a really important point, because it is extremely easy to confuse. But graphs that graph state correspond to are not the same as quantum networks. That I, that's why I really try to use the different style to, to really picture both of them. Because it is really easy to confuse, but there is no correspondence with, between them. We will assume always that our quantum networks are fully connected. However, we will not assume such for graphs. OK, so not, now let's go to actually the, the paper that I based my work on. So in this paper, among other things, they showed that no graph states up to 12 vertices in 
allow SR, meaning local operations, shared randomness, quantum networks with bipartite services can be, can, no graphs can be generated in these networks. Why only up to 12? Well, because they tried to basically generalize this way of proof that I showed you for GSZ. However, this really becomes problematic if we start to consider more and more involved graphs. So here we have some graph. And for these kinds of graphs, the larger the graph gets, the larger the stabilizing operators get. And this is the problem because then in our tracing out, so we, if we calculate expected value of this, of this operator, we can get these kinds of structures of quantum networks. And, it is and we want to relate this expected value of this uh, operator to the expected value over original network. But to do that, we would have to get a fully connected, connected network here. And this becomes more and more difficult, the more parties we have to consider. So lar the larger the operators get, it's harder and harder to really create quantum net, uh, network inflations that would really allow us to perform this proof. That that's why they only did it for up to 12 vertices. Okay, so now we go to what we actually did. Uh, first, uh, let me say what we assume about graph states because um, we basically have a proof for all graph states. However, there are some assumptions to exclude the trivial ones. So we assume that there are at least three vertices. This assumption is mainly because we assume that the networks have bipartite sources. And so if we only had two parties, then a two-party graph state can be generated trivially, just setting sigma to a graph state and not doing anything on each party. And we also assume that at least one vertex is connected to at least two other vertices. And this is basically all the assumptions that we ha really have to make. So then there's this theorem. So if we consider a graph G with uh, n being the number of vertices, and where at least one vertex has a neighborhood of larger or equal to two, these are two assumptions that I told you before, a graph state G corresponding to this graph cannot be generated in an LOSR n partite quantum network with bipartite sources. OK. So to start really um, explaining in basic terms what the proof is, and I won't really go into details. I just want to give you a, to a, an idea of what actually is different between this previous work and this one. Uh, let us consider these kinds of network inflations. This TK, RK, RK, TK prime, RK prime, these aren't parties. These are a set of parties. And we assume that each party in take TK is connected to each other party in TK. And also, if there is a connection, so there is a connection between TK and RK, we assume that each party from TK is connected to each party from RK. So yeah, so this is basically a set of assumptions. And this, this structure will appear many times in this proof. So okay, uh, so to give you an idea, let's uh, refer it back to what I showed previously. So if we set TK to one, RK to three, and this is uh, one thing I forgot to mention, this is uh, fully symmetric. So TK, uh, TK prime is just TK with primed parties, the same for R RK. So if we say TK to one, RK to three, we get this network inflation. And if we set TK to empty and RK to one and three, we get this network inflation. Because each R here we can see that only TKs are connected to two primes. So if there is no connect, so if there is no party here, there is there is no connection here, likely uh, likewise also here. So we only have this structure, and every party in this is connected with each other, and every party from this is connected to this. So hence, we get this quantum network. OK, so as with GHZ, we start from the, uh, from the operators that anti-commute. Here we, here we put prime to force them to anti-commute. This is a 
general stabilizing operator of a graph state. And this is just Z on each, uh, on each neighbor of one except for two, because we had to exclude two to put a prime here. So we start again from this. And this network inflation, these sets aren't really that nice. However, why we take this T0 as such will become pretty clear in a second when I will consider each expected value separately. So we start from this expected value, so in the first one. OK, so from this point of view, this, as we can see, here we have n1, and here we have also n1. So and here, here we have 2 prime. So OK, so 1. 2 prime is here, so we have to uh, we cannot trace it out. And t part of this expected value, the uh, parties of from this expected value is in this, and par and this part of this in the is uh, in this other set. Not all of them, but I will call it t1. Okay, so we have this structure. Every party from t1 is connected to t0, every party from t0 is connected to itself and to, to prime. OK, so using this, again, this uh, property that each party acts with the same local operations, each copy of a party, we can actually switch them around. So here we had t0. Now we moved it over here. Here we had t1. Now we move it over here. And we switched to with the two prime with two. The, the structure of this network, visible network, didn't change. However, the labels did. OK, so, uh, and so now we can actually define the next network inflation as such. So we have I1 here. Here is uh, T1 that I talked about, that I showed you before. And R1 is T0 plus all of the uh, parties that are not really uh, that are trivial in, in with respect to this ex expected value. Okay, so we defined I1 basically for this expected value. So it's no surprise that this is an equality. And this is actually a oper gener uh, stabilizing operator of a graph state also. So we can make a shorthand to G1. Again, we use this, uh, we cannot uh, refer G1 to the original network, so we use this decomposition that is based on the stabilizing argument. If we multiply these two together and this state is stabilized, then we, we get this. So if this and this is true, then this is also true. And there is a detail that I don't want to go get into it, but uh, really we can show also that for all n in T1, so in the um, this neighborhood one no, um, intersection of neighborhood one and two. For all n in this set, we can find, find gi such that on the second party it is one, and on the nth party it is z. And this is this gi that we uh, we take this gi to be this. So we look at the first. This, is, this has uh, one on the second party, which if we trace out every, every other party, means that we have the structure. Because there is nothing on the primes, there is nothing here, so we have the structure. However, we assume that every party from T1 is uh, connected to each other and to uh, R1, and likewise in R1 every party is connected, which means that this is actually a fully connected network. And this means that we can refer it to the original network, which in turn means that this is equal to one. Now we look at this. This has this nice property that, okay, we know that G1 is also, of N has Z, Z also, because N is from the set, from this set. So G1 also has to have Z here. So multiplying it on the nth party, we have one. This gives us this structure. So basically, T1 minus this one party, because everything else can still be in this expected value, 
we have two because uh, G1 is connect. Uh, for, uh, G1 has Z, Z2 and GI does not. So on the second part, on the second party, this is equal to Z. So uh, we have this structure, and we can actually define again for this very expected value quantum inflation I2, which differs from I1 just by moving one party n from this to this. Okay, so we have this correspondence. And this is basically what I realized and why I was able to, make, uh, to create this proof. And pre uh, previously, it was not possible. Because I realized that you don't really have to use only uh, three inf uh, two inflations. You can use a series of inflations. And so the main idea is to, again, apply this kind of proof. Uh, OK, oh, so this is one small detail, but mm, OK, but I will talk about it in a second. Uh, the idea is to, again, apply this, because we, uh, we showed that we can find GI such that it uh, really has an identity on 2 and has z on n for all n in this. So we can, repeating this operation, we can exclude every party from t. So we can move every party from t to r. And if we do that, we have a fully connected network. So this is our goal. So um, basically, to achieve that, uh, this was what we did previously. So this is the composition that we did previously. We started from G1, and uh, we, if this is and this is true, then G1 uh, is equal to one. Expected value on G1 is equal to one. We showed that this is true, and we showed that this is equal to this expected value on I2. And we can again apply the same argument here. Here, this expected value by the same argument as before, as here, this expected value also equals to one because this does not contain two, so we have a fully connected network. And this is G1 again. So if we collapse these two relations, we basically get that G1, expected value of G1 on I2, if this is equal to one, then this is equal to one. OK. And like I said, we can do it for all n. So we can remove every t by just iterating. So then again, we get an inflation I3, which is just removing another uh, party from T1. So moving it fr from here to here. And we get another step in our chain of implication. And if we go at some point for some Q that is basically equal to the size of this set T1, we get the structure. And like I said, we assume that every party from this is connected with each other, and every party from this is connected to this. So this is a fully connected, fully connected network. And since in this, there is no part non-trivial matrix on party with prime, we are actually sure that this is equal to one on the, our assumption that the graph state is generated on the original network. And through this chain of implications, we get we go to this expected value. So we basically deal with this one. We only are left with this, but I will not really uh, make you suffer any longer. And I will just say, OK, this is really simple to prove, so I will not go, get into it. Basically, what, uh, what you have to do here is realize that, OK, because this set is defined in such a way. This is a neighborhood of N2. So this is basically, if we, if we put a smoke here, this is almost a fully connected, a fully connected network, except for one party in T0, which is one. And that's basically it. So we have to apply the same argument once, and we get, again, that this is equal to one, and we have a contradiction which shows that, OK, if we assume that graph states uh, of a certain type can be generated in a quantum network, then we get this contradiction, so they cannot be. And now, just briefly, I will talk about QDIT. Uh, we also can define for graph states for QDIT. And here I will talk only about d equals prime, uh, db prime. 
So here we have just, instead of just simply one connection, we also allow many connections between vertices. And this only adds certain uh, powers in the stabilizing operators. But the definition is still the same. And actually, the proof is really, really similar. The only difference is the inequality that we will use, which basically is this. And if we apply the same, if we insert the same stabilizing operators, but with gammas here, which means that this is just these kind of powers, we get the same argument. And we, by the same argument, basically, we can show that this is equal to one, this is equal to one. And so this is always violated for NAD being prime. And that's where, where I would stop two days ago. However, <laughs> uh, yesterday I learned that uh, there is a paper that actually shows something from and from this theorem in this paper, the case for d equal two and three follows. There is still some merit, obviously, like I did it for our prime d, and also uh, our method allows us to later you maybe compute robustness. However, this I, I just wanted to make that clear because yeah, I think it's important to really uh, say if someone did something first. So yeah, so there's this paper and it's from 2020, I think. Okay, so that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for your nice talk. Are there any questions from the audience? Hello, Odish. Yeah, yeah. uh, so those inequality that you presented um, deduct mm -hmm. entanglement in those networks uh, mm -hmm. by assuming. Uh, so it's not device independent, right? Mm. So, in a sense. So can you can you provide a device independent certification? Um, I didn't really get into it. Uh, this paper that I based my research on uh, talked about uh, basically checking the connection in the network. I know this is possible, but mm -hmm. uh, to really show the device independence, then you have to have some Bell inequalities, and this is not mm -hmm. so easy for network setting okay. because then the local uh, local set isn't convex and okay. uh, no, no, not local quantum set isn't convex. So. Okay. Okay. I have a stupid question. Uh, so how how to think about uh, shared randomness without classical communication? Uh, like uh, how... Basically, it can be that you first meet with every party in this network and you yes. say, OK, we have some strategy. Mm -hmm. So if we get something, we do something. This allows you to really have one strategy for every possible case, and you not really communicate for each consecutive generation of a state. I see. Uh, so you kind of like have a, uh, some uh, strategy for creating correlated. Yeah, yeah, but numbers. that's only one way of looking at it. You also uh -huh. can look at it as a correlation between maybe sources of quantum. Yeah, so. Or just some classical coloration of be, uh, between local operations that each party do, and then they don't really know about it. Sure. So, like, I mean, and, uh, and about this quantum stuff. So, you mean that you could just like entangle some uh, parties beforehand, then and then just uh, uh, like uh, uh, just measure them and do this uh, strategy that you. Yeah. That you uh, uh, um, uh, created before. Okay, cool. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Any other question? Uh, hi, uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. oh, very good. So, uh, my question is: You said said that uh, you you say uh, I mean the, one of the assumptions is that LOCC operations are not allowed, right? Uh, I mean CC mm, because like uh, LO is still. Oh, LO is yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So I mean, uh, but if we say that if we remove that assumption, can every state be generated in like any multipartite quantum state can be generated in this network? I guess uh, there is. If this is something that I'm not really sure about, uh, because I for... mean, in the bipartite case, we can say because 
Mm -hmm. uh, so if we have just yeah, two parties, but with bipartite, then you have bipartite sources, right? So you can generate everything. Yeah. This is I mean, basically. If you, have, if you have just five plus, you can generate any quantum state, any bipartite quantum state from that, right? Using uh, LOCC. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, if you have LOCC, you can generate everything. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I mean, for like even in networks, you can do that, right? Like, yeah, yeah. But basically, but this is then it's a question of like uh, like I said, a lot latency in the network and also okay. how many actually measurements do we have to do to achieve to really get your state. Okay. And you said that, uh, okay, and another question that uh, your local operate, so you consider any local operation, right, on each of the parts. Yeah, yeah. So now let's say that I do a measurement on, let's mm -hmm. say my operation is a measurement. So now yes. how do I represent such a state in like, you get some state out of it, right? Uh, yes, but <laughs> if you have a destructive measurement, then this is not really a local op operation in a sense because like then you can you don't really have a state afterwards then you you would have to really code this information into the state mm -hmm. and yeah okay. so this is one restriction but yeah i i'm not really sure what would happen if you for example did a measurement on one party and mm -hmm. then I, I because I talked about uh, on a conference I talked with someone and there is some strategy that for some cases you can actually like make this communication afterwards so you can like make all of your measurements that you want so for example for like some uh, key distribution or something and then communicate only afterwards and this is fine so there are some like edge cases for which this classical communication doesn't really involve uh, increasing the delay but uh, this is not for all nice okay thanks any other question so maybe i would have one which i asked you many times i guess okay so concerning the so for like if you have q with graph states it's known that they are equivalent to all stabilizer states yes what was the situation for like qd graph states it's the same i guess no uh, yes, I do believe so. They're equivalent, like yes. stabilized state. Yes, yes, yes. If I remember correctly, the paper, yes. And can you say again what, what was done in this paper by Ming Xing Luo, the one that uh, you mentioned at the end of, of the talk? This, uh, ah. they uh, like he basically, uh, he or she, I don't actually know, uh, they basically did. Uh, Show, showed and this is like in the title new genuinely and multi-partite entanglement and they defined this um, entanglement as an LOSR operation and they showed that for local dimension two and three and uh, um, a state that cannot be described uh, like a um, bipartite sum this is like I don't remember really the, the exact name, but basically, if you have a state that you cannot describe as a sum of like over lambda p lambda uh, one state on one partition times state on the other b partition, and mm -hmm. this b partition may vary. If you, you cannot describe the state in such a way, then you cannot generate it in a quantum network if your uh, if you're after your local operation, your uh, local dimension is two or three. Yeah, so that, that's he or she also, so yeah. he or she also proves that the graph states can be generated for all graph no. states. Yes, I mean, not that's all, be, not all because uh, for the ones I exclude, you can actually describe them in, a, in this way that I mentioned. So you can basically, as a tensor product of the raw on one B partition, and raw on the other B partition, because if you if you also include these. I basically I exclude the graph states that are uh, of a form of like this just lines. If you have a graph, then this is just basically unconnected lines. Mm -hmm. This I uh, only I uh, only this I exclude. So, and what what is this notion? New genuinely multiparty entanglement is the one. Yeah, so so this is basically a genuine entanglement it's GME, but uh, but you assume that uh, you also can do local operations. So this is, you cannot describe it as a, 
uh, uh, LOSR. So you assume that, the, so, so you basically assume this form of a state that I showed in this LOSR quantum mm -hmm. networks. This raw equals sum over lambda, P lambda, and you have uh, this yeah, epsilons, and then you have the state, yeah. So if you cannot describe it in such a way, then uh, this is new GME. Yeah. OK. OK, so any other question? Uh, yes, I have one. Yeah, over there, this is Gautam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in the three-party uh, three party network, uh, the, you discussed about two kinds of inflations, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, is there, uh, I mean, is it the case that we don't need more than two inflations or the, in the three-party network, there are no, uh, more, no, not no. more than two networks possible? Uh, um, no, I only talked about them because they are useful for GHZ, but uh, you can basically do everything. So if you have like this, you can connect one to f three prime and three and one prime to three, and you can actually have more copies of parties. Some people, some um, some people actually did uh, this inflation method for these big really inflations where you have k copies of each party and k co copies of each source. So no, 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 I just used these because they are useful and they are kind of easy to wrap your head around it, but uh, you are free to do whatever you want. Basically, you, there are no real constraints on, on network inflations. They are just a tool. So you have to construct them in such a way that they are useful to you. Okay, and in our in your case, only two in, uh, inflations were enough to show. Right? Yeah, for GHZ, so, yeah, this is enough. But then again, uh, like my contribution was realizing that you actually need. I mean, maybe not need, but it is far more uh, far easier to use many inflations for graph states, not only two. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you, Avijush, once more for the nice presentation.